welcome to the Jodie Bunting podcast, where today's episode is simply, who is Jodie Bunting? Now, the fast way to find out, you can actually say, Alexa, who is Jodie Bunting? And she will tell you exactly who I am. If you want to know from the horse's mouth, then I am the one to tell you. Is it the horse's mouth? I think it's the horse. Uh, Anyway... (laughs) So today on the podcast, I'll be telling you exactly who I am, what I do, what I do, and what I have done. Um, so I'm 45 years old. I was born on the 27th of January 1978 uh, in a town called Burton on Trent in Staffordshire. But I grew up over the border uh, in my family home in Hatton in Derbyshire, where I actually still live right now. Um, I work as a online holistic lifestyle coach and also a fitness instructor at my local gyms. Um, and the biggest change in my life was when I went to work in Egypt back in 2006. Uh, and I saw there people, because I've battled with my weight all my life, I saw people over there that were not overweight, that were really healthy. And this kind of changed my life because I wanted to be like those people. I wanted to be happy and healthy and not on this constant struggle to be healthy or slim uh, that I find myself on. So that's my story in a nutshell. And to go into the details now, uh, when I was a child, uh, I was... When I was six years old at school, I was six stone. When I was 12 years old, I was 12 stone. So um, I remember the school nurse plotted my graph of my weight and my age, and it was going up steadily. And that's not a good thing, by the way. That's definitely not a normal thing. Uh, And when I got to 14 years old, I got up to 19 stone. Uh, One of the biggest reasons that I got so big, so quickly, so young, uh, was because I loved food. Uh, My mum and dad both worked at the local Nestle factory. Now, the factory that they worked actually only made coffee, but they did have a staff shop which sold all the products, the sweets, the chocolates from the whole company. So I remember getting home from school and gorging on sweets and chocolate. Literally, I couldn't even breathe or chew because I was ramming so much of this processed sugary crap down my mouth. Uh, and you know, it's it sounds awful, but I really loved it. You know, I really did love food as a child. Uh, even when I was going to school, my grandma's house was on the way to school. So I used to have breakfast at home, call into her house and actually have another breakfast as well. So my whole setup as being a child was revolved around food. And because I'm quite a from a big family, a lot of my family members would celebrate all the birthdays, all the the seasonal celebrations, and it would all be around food, which is not too different um, to other families and other people. But because I was actually having all the food on my own as well as in a group, that's obviously what led to my weight to balloon. Then... Um, In my teenage years, especially towards the end of my uh, secondary school, my mum started to take take me to a slimming club. Um, It was called Shoreway in Etwell, and I still remember the leader, Vanessa. She was my first experience of going to a slimming club. Uh, It was counting calories. To be honest, I didn't really listen all that much. Uh, And then for some reason, in the last year of school, I decided that now was the time. Maybe I was scared, you know, what was going to, I was going to be out of that comfort zone of school and actually step into the real world. So for whatever reason, uh, the last year of school motivated me. Uh, And I do remember in my swimming club, um, they had a fitness instructor who came along and did a little demo of something called step aerobic, stepping up and down on a box to music. Um, And she said that she taught the class uh, next door to where we had our swimming club, invited us all along. Now, I went along and that was my first group fitness experience. And I just loved it. So I was about 13, 14 years old. um, And it was just the music blaring out. It was also the fact that you're doing step you've got like your own little space as well your own little world to dance around in so it didn't really matter whether you were following it or or whatever because you were kind of just 
having a bit of fun with your little step. Anyway, I loved it. And I knew from that first class that I wanted to do it long term. You know, this was, I'd found my calling almost. Uh, because at school, it was that time as well where you had to do your um, options and think about what you're going to do after school, college and stuff. So I think as well, uh, that time I was looking for, you know, something that I actually enjoyed. I think the careers advisor asked me, like, what do you want to do? And I was completely clueless to, to what I actually wanted to do in life. Uh, I actually signed up for catering college just because the careers advisor saw me as a fat kid and th thought, oh, he must love food. Uh, that he'll be a great chef. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of my thought pattern at that time. And then thanks to going to these fitness classes, I actually started to go and regularly a couple of times a week. Uh, even my dad's friend at work took me along to his local gym as well. So I really threw myself in fitness wise, as well as back at the slimming club, I was still going with my mum every week. And I just started to focus more on the food and actually follow the plan. I think before I wasn't really doing it, but this time I was actually listening to what they're saying and actually following it. Um, and I went from 19 stone down to, I think about 11 stone, 10 stone. Um, so yes, I lost a lot of weight and I went, I finished school and went to college at my normal weight, you know, what the weight I should be for that age. Um, also during that time, one of my inspiration was gladiators. So on TV, there's a TV show, um, for those of you who don't know what Gladiators is, it's basically a entertainment show, but it's a very physical one. Uh, and I loved that show and I was kind of inspired to get fit as well uh, by the Gladiators on TV. Uh, I met them. I um, used to write to them. Uh, so it was, it, I cringe now when I think back to it. But as a child, you know, it's great role models to have. If you look, about, look, look at kids' role models today, footballers and all that sort of jazz, then gladiators were definitely more uh, kid friendly. So after my weight uh, loss, I appeared in the local uh, Derby Telegraph, uh, which lead, led to national press. And when I was in the national press, one of the uh, magazines organised a photo shoot with the gladiators. So again, that was a uh, highlight of my teenage years um, and decided, as I said, that I wanted to teach fitness. I went off to catering college, uh, but my dream was still to teach fitness. But you weren't allowed to actually get your qualification until you were 18. So when I was 18 years old, I think literally the day or the day after, I started my course for my level two uh, exercise to music, it's called basically group fitness. Um, before I started the actual qualification, because I've got a big family and they knew that I was regularly attending a class, I rented the local school hall, my primary school hall, and actually started to teach a little unofficial fitness class to my aunties and a few of my cousins as well. So I was kind of so well into teaching because I was attending personally and I was actually teaching already. So my confidence levels, when I actually went on the course, I was so ready for it. And practically, I did do it. You know, it was a breeze. My confidence levels, all the other people on the course were like, they were not so sure because they hadn't taught before, but I was teaching on a weekly basis for, I think, two years before I qualified since I was 16. The one thing I did fall back on at that point was the theory. And I remember I had to do it three times just to get all the muscles and all the bones because it was basically like a quite a hard exam to remember all the different muscles and bones and stuff in your body. But third time, lucky, I passed. Uh, so I went off to catering college um, and there I would eat a lot because although I was exercising a lot, I was still eating too much um, and slowly started to put on the weight. Uh, not massively, but again, noticeably, I was having to buy bigger clothes. Um, when I was um, at the end of college, I also met uh, Phoebe's mum, Raylene. Um, and when I got into a relationship with her, this is where, because we were both chefs, we were both met at the catering college, this is where the weight really started to pile on, to be honest. This was the, t the turning point in the bad way. Uh, we would be going out together. We would be uh, making nice food for each other. We'd be buying takeaways together. Every single bad food you could eat, um, we were doing it together and really enjoying it as well. 
Uh, I'll give you my typical day of eating. So breakfast, uh, I'd work a late shift, so I probably wouldn't have any breakfast. And then for lunch, I'd have like two of those big crispy chickens, plate full of curly fries and a tin of beans, a whole bottle of uh, lemonade mixed with orange juice. Remember, I loved that drink. And then maybe even half a chocolate gatto, which I would share with my girlfriend at the time. Uh, I was working in a call centre, so there we'd have snacks, crisps, sweets, chocolate bars, more fizzy drinks, uh, maybe some sandwiches from the vending machine. And then for dinner on the way home, um, maybe we'd have some uh, McDonald's, uh, even maybe we'd have a kebab, uh, four light meaty sandwiches from the uh, supermarket on the way home. Uh, and I do remember often thinking, oh, I'm trying to lose some weight, I'm trying to cut down, I'll take some sandwiches into work with me. And then on the way home, being so starving hungry, we'd go to McDonald's and I wouldn't just have a Big Mac. I'd have two cheeseburgers as well and I'd have a box of 20 chicken McNuggets, probably an apple pie and a McFlurry. I kid you not, I would have that much McDonald's and that would be like 11 p.m. after we'd finished the call centre work. So you can soon start to see why I went from 11 stone to 31 stone. So that's like putting on 20 stone in like three or four years. It sounds like a lot, but because every single day I was eating like 5,000 calories, uh, you're starting to see why I put it on so much. So at 31 stone, um, I what had a girlfriend, I had Raylene, um, and amazingly, she got pregnant. <laughs> Don't ask how a 31 stone man uh, is able to create a baby, but I was able to create a baby, amazingly. Um, our first baby actually died. Um, I was not really ready for a child at that point. I was a bit freaked out when she was first pregnant, um, but I... When we got into the third trimester, when, when we lost the first baby, I would really came round to it. I was really excited about it. So actually, um, we tried straight again for another baby after we lost the first one. And this is where Phoebe was born. Now, just before Phoebe was born, um, I appeared in the local newspaper because I was still teaching my fitness class for my family at this point. Uh, and I also started to work for the local Derby City Council, uh, teaching a couple of fitness classes for them. Uh, they were very basic classes. It was seated classes or exercise for the not so fit, as they used to call it. Um, and basically, because I was doing some charity work as well through fitness, got into the local paper, that got onto the national press. Uh, and I ended up appearing on ITV's Trisha called Is Fat Sexy? And it's still the most... Um, remembered thing, I get people now, 20 years after this, 25 years after this appeared on air, still remember me from Trisha. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, I jumped on the stage at 31 Stone, kicked my leg in the air and said, who out there can do that? Uh, the producers told me to say that. So cheesy, uh, but yeah, you can see why people remembered me. Anyway, Phoebe was born, Raylene had the baby, um, and from there, we split up about six months afterwards. For those of you who are new to parenting or have been a, a, a parent, you know you know how stressful it is when you have got a newborn. Um, and life just got, you know, unbearable for us both. And we got to the stage where we said we would enjoy life better alone. So that's when we split up. Um, at the beginning, I was still... It was quite amicable with uh, Raylene and we'd still take Phoebe out on day trips and I'd go out with them, go around for dinner and stuff like that. Um, and then she met someone else and they moved down to Somerset. So that was kind of the the deterioration with my relationship with Phoebe and her mum, which I understood, you know, at that point, if I'd met somebody and I wanted to go and start a new life somewhere else, I probably would have done exactly the same. So I definitely don't blame her. And to be honest, Phoebe had a great upbringing in Somerset, living in the country um, and just enjoying life. So with regards to myself, uh, being young, free and single again. Obviously, I was still 31 stones at that point. Uh, but that was also the turning point for me. You know, I had a new life. 
I wasn't stuck in this heterosexual relationship. I could be more free. I could be this gay person that I'd been dreaming of for years and years. Um, started to go out clubbing with a few of my gay friends from work. Um, and my confidence, confidence levels just started to um, go through the roof, really. Uh, the, can, the council that I was working for doing the exercise for the not so fit classes, uh, they launched a new program where it was just going to be classes just for overweight people. And they got me to spearhead this. Uh, again, that was in the local press. And the headline there was I was leaving my uh, call centre job to go and uh, teach fitness full time because these fitness classes that I started just for the overweight became so popular that I was able to do that. Uh, that story made it into the national press and then I went on The Big Breakfast on Channel 4 uh, to do an interview about it. They love me so much. They literally, I think the same day, they called me and offered me um, a job to teach fitness professionally uh, one day a week on uh, Channel 4 Live. The strange thing was I'd done the local uh, TV station uh, just a week or so before this and I'd said to them, and I've still got a video on my website now, my dream is to get my own national TV fitness slot like Mr Motivator and bang, a week later it was there for me on a plate. So for those of you out there that don't believe what you say what you envisage, your, you know, setting out your goals don't come true. There is proof right there, guys. If you just put it out there, it could be just a written uh, diary to yourself or it could be you tell all your friends and family what your goals are. It's just so important to do that because, you know, that's proof that it will work. So what was I doing on the ground then, actually, nutritionally? Um, this is not something I would do now, uh, but this was my diet at the time. So I'd have two poached eggs on wholemeal dry toast, so no butter. Uh, I'd have ketchup on it, or I'd have two Weetabix with skimmed milk and some artificial sweetener. And then for lunch, I would have pasta with a tomato sauce. Then in the evening, maybe a jacket potato with tuna and low fat mayonnaise. Uh, and as some little snacks, sometimes I'd have a little bit of Diet Coke, I'd have a little bit of sugar-free jelly, I may even have an apple, uh, which from why I've just told you now was my only fresh fruit and veg <laughs> for the day. I remember also beans on toast used to be a little uh, luxury for me because I knew um, from my slimming and calorie days, it contained a lot of sugar and there was more calories in there. Um, so again, looking back at my diet, I actually can't believe that I managed to lose 10 stone in a year. But this is the A, the power of exercise, but also the power of protein. I was getting the um, protein from the eggs in the morning. I was getting the protein from the tuna on the jacket potato. So I think this was my saving grace, the fact that I was just having uh, enough protein to keep me satisfied uh, while I was doing all this exercise. Now, during this time, I joined David Lloyd, uh, which is a health club near me with an outdoor pool. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily the um, exercise I was doing there because sometimes I used to just go and swim four lengths and then with my friend would go in the steam room or the sauna, the jacuzzi, outdoors. It was more the fact I was keeping myself busy going to the health club. I think that was the the key looking back now. Um, and again, I always say it's boredom eating, it's snack eating, which makes a lot of people eat and put on weight. So just trying to find a hobby like going to a health club, especially with a friend or a family member, um, was really one of my keys there. Now, because of my uh, national work on TV, um, my classes became ever so popular. Uh, so I was making um, a good wage and could actually afford uh, not to work full time. And I was just teaching my fitness classes, doing my weekly slots in London. Uh, I got to be uh, a guest on things like uh, The Lorraine Show, uh, was in magazines regularly as well. Um, so as a 20, how old was I, 21 year old, you know, suddenly had this newfound fame. It was nice and it was a novelty, uh, but I was still 
inside gearing towards losing weight. I did start to go clubbing with my friends and, you know, just enjoying life. But the good news was I didn't go on that destructive path, which a lot of people do, especially when they're young and they get some newfound fame. And just, I remember on a Monday, I used to do my fitness slot live on the big breakfast and on the same day, travel back to Derby and actually do my fitness class on a Monday night. And I think that was my grounding. You know, in the morning, I will be teaching to the nation. In the evening, I'd be teaching to my overweight fitness class of 20, 30 people um, who, who got me that slot. So I was very thankful and I stayed with my you know, my core crew right from the beginning, which again helped me keep my feet on the ground. Um, the Big Breakfast, some of the highlights on there was doing the Christmas Panto with Westlife. Um, great, great <laughs> experience. Dancing for Atomic Kitten, meeting people like Vanessa Feltz, Chris Moyles. Uh, the presenters at that time were Richard Bacon and Amanda Bryan. And again, they were really supportive uh, of me. And then when I was walking around Sainsbury's back in Derby, uh, these two people came up to me and asked me whether I was Jodie Bunting from The Big Breakfast. And I said, confirmed, yes. And they said, we're from Ram FM. We're the breakfast presenters and we'd love you to come on the show. So a few days later, I went on the show. Um, and just like with The Big Breakfast, they also offered me a job and said, why don't you come on a weekly basis? Do a little fitness slot here. It wouldn't be paid, but obviously it's great local coverage because at that point I was teaching locally a lot in Derby. So I started to work on Ram FM, uh, voluntary, uh, but it was just, to be honest, it was more fun than the big breakfast, going around locally with something called the Black Thunders, the outdoor uh, crew. We'd go out, we'd give out prizes, we'd do live links. I had a little uh, live air monitor system and I'd be interviewing people or they or the thunders that were with me would be interviewing me on different things and it was just fun and as the uh, time went on I lost my contract with Channel 4. Uh, one of the interesting things about that was I was what's classed as a guest expert so for a couple of months or a couple of weeks you'd have your weekly slot but to be honest the novelty would soon wear off and you'd be done uh, but I was really lucky the fact that my contract was renewed um, and I stayed on more than the average Joe, um, which again, I'm kind of proud of. I think it was because we brought so much energy to the slot and it wasn't me just doing fitness, you know, because people were following my journey. I was giving out diet tips, which I didn't write to my, write for myself. My produce, producers wrote all those for me. So I can't A, take credit and B, I wouldn't want to take credit for some of the advice I gave to the nation at that point. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I lost my slot, wasn't really that bothered because I was living life in Derby, uh, working on Ram FM. Um, from there, I got to my goal weight, which again was so exciting. Um, I've still got the photo now where on a Monday night, I used to weigh live in front of my class members on a Monday night and get into my goal weight, which was 11 stone something. Um, it was fantastic, you know, just being for three years, weighing in front of those class members every single Monday was such a joy. Uh, and to finally get to my goal, I remember standing on the on the scales. There's a photo of this with me holding a bottle of champagne that my mum and the class members had bought for me. And I was literally crying because I was so happy. You know, when you've been working so long for a specific goal like this, to actually get there was emotional in a great, great way. And again, all my class members were so inspired. So from there, I wanted a new challenge. Um, I went to um, actually work for Fitness First Health Club. So I was on what's called the circuit, the freelancer circuit, but I wanted to be more stable actually in a club. So I went to work for Fitness First as their uh, group fitness manager. Um, and basically led the system really energetic wise. I was at my goal weight. So to be honest, I wasn't really interested in those larger than life classes just for the overweight. I actually wanted to do mainstream fitness. And also within the health club, I was pushing fitness generally for everybody into the community, kids, uh, seniors, just every little box that you could tick that you could get into the community. I was doing it. Um, got to a stage um, 
where I just wanted more. So I had some friends in London at that point. So I went down and moved in London, transferred my work with Fitness First, moved to a few different health clubs down there. Now, when I was in London also, I ran the London Marathon, which was, again, a great achievement. I'll be writing a bit about my book in a few weeks about that, but I'll tell you that story then. Um, and again, was just touring around, just kind of doing my thing. Nothing really outstanding. Uh, for Fitness First, they did recognise my marketing potential, especially because I'd lost so much weight. And I worked for them nationally doing a tour on their new, basically their version of Weight Watchers. And I went around the country promoting um, the Weight Loss Club. That that's what it was called and there was a big banner of me uh, and mine before and after photo outside every fitness first health club so again that was if you look back now it was actually a massive thing for me to do and if social media had been around by then wow you know I would have had a million followers by now but social media wasn't around and there was me in my car driving around doing these personal appearances uh, launching the weight loss club in all these different places so from there, um, I won my award. So this was um, me and uh, one of my friends who worked at the health club in London went to an award ceremony. I had um, applied for fitness group, fit, group exercise manager of the year, which basically is within the fitness industry. Uh, and I told them about all the community work I'd done, my own weight loss story, and just gave loads of press cuttings, all the evidence that I did. Uh, went along to the awards night and actually won it. I actually won great, like best UK fitness group fitness manager. It was such a achievement. Not only was I new to the industry, I used to be 31 stone, I had not gone the professional route at all. Normally people get into the professional uh, to be a fitness instructor because they professionally do it, or sorry, amateurly they do it. You know, they've got a keen interest in fitness and then they become an instructor and work themselves up but i had done it the other way you know almost i was a joke artist teaching at 31 stone got a national uh coverage and then slowly started to make my career full time but i won the award and again that was a, a wonderful thing uh, during this time as well is when I had my uh, tummy tuck. So I didn't have weight loss surgery. I must point this out, guys. I had the surgery to get rid of my loose skin. Um, and that was um, where it was a big operation where I couldn't teach for three to six months. I couldn't even drive a car for six weeks as well. Um, but something that I really wanted to have done, not on a vanity point of view, but when I was teaching fitness, my loose skin would literally slap together. When I was doing jump jacks in my fitness classes, you could hear the skin slapping together. So that is the real reason, and actually the reason I had it done. Uh, at the same time, they did a butt tuck for me. Um, so I had my tummy and my butt done together, 200 stitches around my waist. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't really recommend it for anybody because the pain was just torturous. Unless your loose skin is really affecting you like crazily, then I wouldn't, um, definitely wouldn't recommend it for vanity reasons. So after this, um, after having been in London for a year, I started to reevaluate again, you know, is this all life has to offer? For those of you that have lived in London, yes, it's nice to visit, but once you're on the tube every day, once you're in that non-community based London, I was living in a place called Finsbury Park, which is not the best area of London. Um, and wanted something more. Financially, I'd used up all my funds from the big breakfast and those sorts of quick media jobs that brought in a lot of money weren't coming in anymore. So financially, I didn't really have anything. Um, mentally, I wasn't really ticking the boxes in life anymore. So I was looking for something different. So I started to search for jobs abroad, got a job teaching fitness in Egypt, for Mark Warner holidays. Now, this is where I went to Haggadah. I'd never been to Egypt before and just loved it. It was just 
the whole the reason I loved it so much is because this British company had 50 British staff, lifeguards and water sports experts and nannies. So you kind of you were in a foreign country, but because you had all the Brit power there, you were kind of being babysitted and kind of you had your British friends as well. So that was why I think I loved it so much. Um, also, at that time, I was uh, slim open for offers, maybe looking for guys, uh, and started to really find Egyptian guys attractive. Uh, I'd had an Indian boyfriend before in my uh, younger days, but never really an African or an Arab, uh, and was just really charmed by these guys. You know, as you know now, um, there's so many scams with Africans, um, but I started to see the innocence. It's different when you go on holiday and you experience somebody and you see that charm. When you're living and working with somebody 24 hours, you know, you start to see the real them. And I loved the real them. <laughs> <laughs> not just physically, but also what they stood for, you know, they the way they did love health. Um, I remember taking one of my friends for a pizza once and he was like, like, what is this? Like, pizza, what is it? What, where did this come from? How was this made? You know, and I respected that and I loved it. And this is where I mentioned at the start of this podcast, this is where my realisation moment came in Egypt because I started to realise you know, fast food, um, industrial revolution foods that we know well in um, the UK and the West. You know, it's not normal. It really isn't normal to have things out of tins, to have processed food, to have tins of tuna, for God's sake. Um, so that opened my eyes and made me realise the world was a much bigger place and a much natural place. And this also made me think maybe this is the key for my own weight loss. Because after having lived in London, I put on a little bit of weight. When I went to Egypt, um, as you may have seen, I was partying a lot, partying hard, not as much as some of the others, uh, but I was enjoying myself and I had put on a little bit more weight. So again, this is where I was looking within uh, and started to looking at the Egyptian um, way of life, shall we say, or a simpler way of life. And looking back to in the UK actually study holistic health and not just the normal personal training, slimming world sort of uh, nutrition. When I came back to the UK um, a couple of years later, I had a few issues then with my daughter um, because she'd gone off down Somerset living her new life and I was busy in Egypt. Uh, initially, I'd come back every three months to see her, then six months. Uh, and by the time I'd come back a couple of years later, she said that she didn't want to see me. Uh, we ended up going to court, and um, which again was the wrong thing to do because it was inflicting the negativity and it was I, the dad was bringing the case to court. So I was painted as the, the bad guy. The court ruling was, I had won officially, but the court, court ruling was uh, Phoebe could see me when she wanted to. But because her mum was obviously telling her things about me disappearing off to Egypt, uh, not saying, you know, he doesn't care about you, but just saying, oh, your dad's gone to Egypt is kind of indirectly making the child think that. Um, so I didn't see my um, daughter then for quite a number of years. Because of this, you know, I threw myself into work, as most people do when something personally is going wrong. But professionally, you can achieve something. That's what I did. Uh, my friend Natasha, I started to work with her. She's one of my friends that I met when I was working in London. And we launched something called The Fact Factor, which, again, is another turning point, a life changing point for me, because this is what I do now. This is Slim Brother. This is my holistic online coaching. This is where I started. So in 2006, 2007, um, I started doing free community weight loss courses. And this was, me and Natasha used to love something called the fat, the, the X Factor, and we created something called the Fat Factor. We did auditions, uh, and basically it was like a slimming club, but just kind of a, a, a fun uh, course aspect to it. Got quite a lot of media coverage with that, um, including being on BBC's the one show which again national coverage again facebook still at that time hadn't really taken off so i didn't get much of a following or any sort of national exposure or national 
appreciation for that, shall we say. Um, but again, business wise, I'm so proud of, you know, doing a community project, it being so successful. Uh, and I took it back to Derby. I moved back to Derby because I was doing my work with Natasha in Kent and Surrey in Essex. Went back up to Derby and launched Slim Brother. And this is where I started to look within. So for those of you who don't know, I became a Christian then at this time. I went to an Alpha course, uh, mainly because I wanted to bring my daughter back into my life. Um, and in my head at that point, I was doing something wrong in my life, not necessarily being gay, but I was doing something wrong in my life that was destroying the relationships in my life so not only my daughter I didn't really have a good relationship with my uh, dad um, my mum's relationship's always been quite good my sister's been off and on as well even though we were really close when we were younger so this is what took me on the religious um, journey again in Egypt I had lots of Christian friends who are very strict and they were very um, vocal about me being gay, as were my Muslim friends as well. Uh, and all those sorts of people all said, you know, your relationship with your father, your child is all because of you are being gay. So I did question it. You know, I'm, I'm open to saying this now. I did think, shall I try and not be gay? So I did the Alpha course. Uh, I did lots of Christian reading. Uh, I should point out at this point as well, I didn't just go straight to Christianity. Um, um, you know, I, I read a little bit of Quran, the uh, Muslim book. I also tried uh, Buddhist, went to the Buddhist center uh, near me. But I just found myself coming back to the church and Christianity because it made so much sense. And I had an inner feeling of calm for it and almost being home, my local church in Hilton, uh, which is where I started to um, go every Sunday or most Sundays. Again, I just felt really home at, the, at home there. Uh, and this is when I completed the Alpha course, uh, was confirmed a Christian. So from here, a um, bit of an up and down story. Uh, had a relationship with a girl, didn't really work out um, and fell out with my sister and her new family even more. Um, and again, it, I was enjoying being a Christian but my life just wasn't as perfect I was expecting it to be perfect you know I don't know why our lives are never going to be perfect but I was expecting it to be perfect it wasn't so after a couple of years in 2010 I went back out to Egypt because I thought look I need to reevaluate. I need to do things differently you know what else can I try uh, what else do I need to do to myself so I went back out to Egypt uh, and started to work in animation. So this is entertainment industry. Um, again, just almost starting again. I wanted to start again. Uh, I was still living as a, I can't say I was living as a heterosexual because I wasn't doing anything with girls or fancying girls, but I also wasn't doing anything with guys. Uh, started to go to the church regularly in Sham in Egypt and was actually baptized again under the Coptic um, branch of the Christian religion, which again was a lot more stricter. But at that time, I thought I needed it uh, just because I thought I was doing something wrong. Anyway, uh, working in Egypt was just uh, going really, really well. I ended up creating my own business again there and I ended up then transferring and working for Royal Albatross Moderna, which again just took my career onto a new level. Instead of going into entertainment, I went into hotel management, customer service. And then on the sideline, I also got to work for Shams Got Talent, which is a presenter job for me, a stage uh, host job. Um, and again, that just took me to meet so many, not only famous people from the UK that were visiting, uh, but also just so many young, talented people from Egypt, but also from Europe that were on holiday there or working there. Um, then working for Soho Square, I did a little bit where I actually worked for them directly. Uh, I did Race for Life for Cancer Reach research uk in the uk had fun creating somebody called pink gargar who many of you know now is my drag ultra e, e uh, ego um it all started just dressing up for a nightclub in egypt and again uh she 
Pink Gaga became quite famous in Egypt and I was launching club nights. I was employed by a few. I was employed by Pasha, believe it or not. I, the fat chubby dancer, was employed by world rena rena <laughs> renowned Pasha nightclub to go and dance on a Saturday night. Just like what I'm telling you now, it's just unbelievable. How the hell did I get to do that? In a, in a way, that's more of an achievement than the big breakfast. Me being a go-go dancer. Anyway, uh, again, that was quite short-lived. Uh, the people around me, um, especially my hotel manager, wasn't too happy about me doing it. You know, as a one-off, as a little bit of fun, it was fine. But when I was doing it like three times a week, I was physically exhausted uh, and I was also uh, mentally exhausted for my job, probably. Um, <clears throat> at that point in my life, I also met the love of my life. So there's an Egyptian guy there who can't reveal his identity uh, for his protection purposes. Um, but this really... In my in my life, I've met a lot of, I've had a lot of relationships with people that I really believed I loved and they loved me. But this one in particular was like next level. You know, when you just, you want to be with them all the time, you want to speak with them all the time, you just want to message them all the time and just, it's crazy. And not only was I feeling like this about him, but it, he was also feeling this about me and possibly even more, dare I say it. So I really loved this guy and decided that I wanted to build a life in the UK for me and him. Uh, we did try for a visa and he didn't get it. Uh, so the plan was that I went back to the UK. Um, one of the reasons we didn't get the visa was because I wasn't financially stable and couldn't sponsor his visit. Um, so I went back to the UK and started to, um, you know, make get a real job and try to make stability so I could bring him across. Um, during that time, um, when I left, me and him kind of separated a little bit. And I'm not one of these people that, and I think a lot of people are as well, that unless you have that face-to-face, -face, your eyes, this is something I've learned, your eyes looking at somebody and feel your heart feeling their heart on a physical way, you know, you haven't got that connection that you need and that your heart and your mind actually needs as well. So we slowly started to drift apart and I went on holiday to Morocco with a friend and met a guy there, um, again, which was great. Um, he was younger than me, uh, really young, 19 and it was almost love at first sight and the bits that were missing with the guy in Egypt was ticked everything was with the Moroccan guy so I started a relationship with him um, and then started to go over there uh, to Morocco I'd never lived there but I went over for a couple of weeks, stayed with his family. So that was kind of a long distance relationship that was working. And because this guy's level of English was so high and his technology and just he was more advanced, we were video chatting every night. And that kind of worked as a long distance relationship. Whereas because the other one was not that technical and didn't have the language skills that the Moroccan did, this is why that one worked long distance and the other one didn't. Back in the UK, um, one of my friends, Jalou, uh, was doing quite well, who I'd met over in Egypt. And we ended up going to the Prince's Trust Garden Party at Buckingham Palace. So again, this is another highlight of my life. This was 2016, meeting Prince Charles, me dressed in a white suit. And Prince Charles looked at me, looked me up and down and said, Spiffing, what a delightful suit. Now King Charles telling me that I've got a delightful suit, which will, uh, you know, it will always remember from my king. Um, from there, for me, professionally, I was working in hotels as duty managers. I was working as sales managers for various different gyms. Uh, but eventually I got back into the fitness industry, was teaching full-time fitness, which again has always been my thing you know my passion in life 
Um, my ex worked for Weight Watchers and she shared something on Facebook about them recruiting. Um, and because I was teaching like 29 classes, 29 to 30 fitness classes a week, which is a lot for somebody who is 30, 40 years old. You know, I was getting on a bit at that point. So I was thinking I'd, maybe I do want to do more of a career. So I applied for Weight Watchers, started to work for Weight Watchers, and again, learned so much from them, not only business-wise, but just people-wise, you know, dealing with mass numbers of people queuing to to weigh and looking for the answer for losing weight. So that was a great learning curve for me. Didn't work out with Weight Watchers, uh, but again, my learning and my life after that created what is now Slim Brother and what I do right here, right now. Now, there was a little uh, dip in my life here. So everything was roses apart from one th issue in 2019 where I suffered a mental health issue called DD. D. This is depersonalization, derealization disorder. Now, when I was uh, working for Weight Watchers, uh, I went to a concert with one of my friends to see Ariana Grande in Sheffield and drank a lot of artificial uh, flavoured Lambrini, which is basically a cheap wine, um, and went on a night out. And from that night out, I had brain frog. I, there was something happening. I didn't really know what was happening. And this was the DDD, the short term mental health condition kicking in. I knew who I was and where I had to go, for instance, but I wasn't really sure how to get there. It was just such a weird sensation. And for two weeks, I was kind of doing my job, but like spaced out doing it. It's very hard to, um, you know, describe exactly how I was feeling or what I was doing. But the point is, I was able to do it. I knew where my place of work was. I knew what to do when I got there, but I was just, I don't know, it's weird. Um, and then that all came to a head when during one of my Weight Watchers meetings, I had a bit of a sugar high meal before um, and kind of just went on this diabetes sugar high um, and just started to be rude, not in an awful way, but rude to the members. And they ended up taking me to a &E because my uh, colleagues knew that there wasn't was I wasn't quite right. Um, in a and &E, um, it got a little bit worse. I went into, for instance, in a and &E, you have to wait in the waiting room. I would just barge straight into the area. Uh, and anyway, just caused a embarrassing issue with myself and the people there. Uh, police ended up getting involved. I got arrested. And it all came down to diabetes. I'd been diagnosed a few years before, not really um, taking care of myself blood sugar wise. Um, and I came and stuck. Weight Watchers sacked me because, um, you know, I was talking on social media about what was happening to me. One of the golden rules, especially when you're working for uh, bigger companies, is that you never mention their name with regards to anything negative online. And I did that, and this is why I ended up losing my job. Uh, but again, this actually pushed me, survival mode pushed me to launch, relaunch Slim Brother in the biggest and best way ever. Um, I carried on also teaching in my uh, fitness classes. Um, so actually, if you look at my bigger journey, you know, all these learning curves has led to what I'm doing now, which is the most exciting thing. And I really feel I'm in my groove. I love what I do. I love coaching one-to-one -one in these groups with my weight loss clients. And I also like teaching my fitness classes. My thing is aqua, that's my speciality. And I just love doing that. Um, over the last few years, I've played with different nutritional plans such as keto, low carb, uh, cutting out gluten, you know, just basically eating clean, which I've always known about ever since studying holistic health and being in Egypt. But now just to challenge myself to make it sustainable long term. You know, I'm still quite a few stones away from my ultimate goal now. But again, just balancing my lifestyle with mentally enjoying myself, but physically not being fat or unhealthy is still a big challenge for me. And this is why I love doing what I'm doing. I'm doing, trying new things um, and just enjoying my job 
but also trying to get that perfect method to help myself, but also to help all my clients. The other thing I'll mention as well at this point, um, as the last five, 10 years, uh, how social media has become. I've had quite a few achievements when it comes to social media. Um, when I was working for Channel 4, just after that, I did uh, something called The Salon and I had a live clonic irrigation. That video has had over a million views on YouTube and altogether, my two YouTube channels have got over 5 million views. So if we wound back social media into my coverage from The One Show and The Big Breakfast, you know, my earning potential could be very different by right now. But you can't live life like that. You know, you can't think, you know, what if, uh, and obviously just make the most of social media right now. And it's amazing how you can still use your claim to fame years on, being 31 stones, working on Channel 4, being on Trisha, um, all those cheesy things. But it's great how just having those sorts of things can give you uh, a little, make you a little bit ahead when it comes to uh, working with the media or even getting little jobs here and now. Which brings me back to this podcast. I've been rattling on for 50 minutes. Uh, but to, <laughs> to the reason to tell you who is Jodie Bunting is because this is one of my passions for the future. You know, loads of people are doing podcasts and I just like to think I'm an easy to talk to person and I'm able to present to you guys, my followers, my friends, my fans, information to help you be healthy, to feel well in a realistic way. You know, I still watch... Um, YouTube videos or listen to podcasts now and I'm like what does that word mean or I just don't get it and this is why this podcast came about because I want to talk about all the different uh, subjects to do with health and wellness and actually translate it into a very user-friendly and more importantly practical way so this is how uh, the Jody Bunting podcast came about and my name is Jodie Bunting. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was my story. Before I go, I should talk to you as well about what's going to be happening in the future. Uh, again, for those of you who don't know, I am currently writing a book. So I will be launching my book uh, maybe next year, maybe the end of this year. Uh, but it's going to be called Slim Brother. It's going to be my journey, how I got from 31 stones uh, and halved my body weight and more. And then also it's going to be my autobiography. So everything I've mentioned in this video, but in a lot more detail with pictures. Do you really want to see it? <laughs> I know there's a lot of people that do. Um, but yeah, my actual vision as well as my book is to also have my own holistic hotel. Whether this is in Egypt, whether this is in the UK, uh, I, envis I envisage it to have a lovely outdoor swimming pool. I envisage to have... No TVs, it's going to be completely like music friendly, holistic friendly, just everything I know that has helped me lose weight. I'm going to put it into a house to help you feel well and lose weight. That is my ultimate dream, guys. And um, one of my other dreams is to help a million people get to their goal weight. And I can do it, you know, through group online courses, through books, through hotels. Uh, whatever you want to call it, this is my mission in life and this is my groove. I couldn't leave you without giving you my top weight loss tips. So these are my personal five weight loss tips if you need to lose fat. Number one is to drink water. Increase your plain water intake to two litres or more every day to help you feel satisfied and improve your overall feelings of well-being. Number two. Focus on nutrients. Eat some local protein, a little healthy fat and some fresh seasonal fruit salads or vegetables with every single meal. Number three, sleep by 10 p.m. as it helps you with your food and activity choices for the following day. And we all know what it's like when you haven't slept properly, you just feel like crap. Number four, 
four is to get outdoors if possible. Um, and when you feel ready, try and do your exercise out, outside. It can just be a 20 minute walk cycle or even a swim outdoors. Maybe do your strength training out, outdoors, get the weights out there in the summer. But just being outdoors in nature, even not even in nature, just being in the fresh air is so good for you on so many different physical and mental levels. Just don't underestimate it. And my last one, tip number five, is to enjoy your journey. There's no use being 100% when it comes to clean eating or gym, stuff like that. You know, have a day off a week. Don't do anything. Don't leave the house. Don't leave your bed if you don't want to. And if you want to have an Easter egg at Easter and some Christmas pudding at Christmas, have it, guys. Just... Look at the bigger picture. Think about the 80-20 rule. 80% of the time you do eat clean and you do be healthy, but 20% of the time do whatever you like. Have a treat day, have a pizza uh, and just enjoy living your life. It's just getting that 80-20 balance, which by the way, I haven't protect, uh, perfected yet, uh, but I am, my, I am on my way to do so. So thank you for listening to this podcast. Um, if you want to know more, go to jodybunting.com and you will find details about my book on there. Uh, if you're watching this um, podcast for the first time, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash jodybunting, or you can follow the podcast on Spotify. Thank you, as always, guys, for your um, support. Uh, in the future, I'll be doing some podcasts on questions and answers. So feel free to either comment on this podcast or send me a private message or send me a voice note as well via the Spotify site and leave me a question. What are your ultimate diet, fitness, wellness questions that you want me to answer even personal questions, guys. I'm open to answering anything. Thank you for listening. That was me, Jody Bunting. I'll see you again soon. Please remember to like, give me a comment, share with your friends, and of course, subscribe to my channel. Thank you.